Okay, in this episode of HubShots episode 290, we're talking about setting life cycle stages on forms and deals, re-engagement emails gone wrong, and deal pipeline currency totals. Plus, some gratitude reminders and thinking about the joy of unread books. Plus, outcome versus activities. So, Craig, let's dive into our growth thought of the week, outcomes versus activities. And uh, so I was reading, I was, I was talking to a friend of mine um, who I've known for a long time and he is very much into sales and he said, oh, look, you should be reading, have a read of Predictable Revenue. So I went and got the audiobook straight away and I started reading it, I started listening to it and one of the, I actually really enjoyed it. Now, I think what's interesting, it was written a while back and They've got a whole training around it. But I, what I liked about it is everything that we know and he just reinforced it. And what was in, and I think one of the key things I want to do is highlight to people that people often focus on activities. So when you look at HubSpot, you can say, I want to see how many calls you're making. I want to see how many emails you're sending. What did you do today? And really be about activity. But are we actually focusing on outcomes and what that is doing for the business. So I think having a process, and I would call these activities a leading indicators to leading to outcomes. So really about where you're trying to focus. And I don't want to, people to get confused with looking and thinking about what are these people doing every day. I need to see what they what they're up to every hour of the day. It's I think I think we're all grown up, and people need to be responsible for their outcomes. And these are the tools that can speed up and make it effective. But I think the, also the other thing is that what it highlights is there are some key things that we all know about. So in the book, he talks about targeting, which I would say is like good segmentation in HubSpot. And we see across portals, uh, often this is very overlooked and underutilized. So people aren't looking at this on a monthly basis. They're not using the tools. So they're not using snippets, they're not using templates, they haven't moved to sequences, so they're doing things in a very manual process. Um, When they're prospecting, do they have the right company insights? Have they actually spent the time to find out more about the person and more about the business? Are they well-educated? So we often say the contact timeline and the company timeline is a good place to get customer intelligence. So are we actually actively looking at it? The next one is uh, qualification. So are we looking at um, lead scoring? Have we thought about lead scoring? And are we using playbooks when we're qualifying people so we can get the data efficiently and store it in the right place and then do other exciting things with that data? And then the follow-throughs, really understanding how to nurture people where they're at, but also be very good with cleaning up. So if people don't want to hear from you, and we'll touch on this in a later shot, is don't be afraid to clean them up. Like remove them from your database or mark them as a non-marketing contact because you don't want them to clog up the system. So I think that's a really key thing. I'm still, uh, I've got another two hours, I think, of the book to go, but I've been really enjoying it because it just really highlights and focuses to you what's important and what to focus on and how to do it. And he does talk about other places about how to get data, how to build teams and other things. But I think if I'm looking at this on a key points, I think there's some very relevant things. And so I recommend everybody expand your horizon and read other books because it might give you something that might change the way you think or that might suit your team. And I think that's the big thing. I think this is such a good reminder. Uh, A lot of people don't even take action. So uh, they sit around procrastinating. So, sure, you've got to take action and that's activity and you give people actions to do. But what you've highlighted is this difference between how and why. So, if people don't know why they're doing it, often they just do things, they follow a checklist and it's no wonder they don't make impact. They're doing stuff but they're not doing the right thing. So, what you've highlighted here is so uh, useful as a reminder. What is the outcome? Answer the question why and it's, it's as simple as chatting with your team. You talked here about prospecting. It's like, okay, here's how you do it, but why? Why are you doing it? Oh, because we want to get this kind of customer or we want to give them this kind of help. I think really good reminder. All right. And 
listeners, can you believe we actually caught up in person after almost a whole year? <laughs> oh, this was so good. And I know we did catch up very briefly on over Christmas, but it's actually been years since, well, we certainly haven't recorded That's together. That's actually. Yeah. Years, but to actually just spend a few hours together in person Correct. was really good. What I wanted to highlight, and this was the, the takeaway that I came up, uh, away with, is we just were very comfortable sitting in silence at times. We'd chat about a few ideas and then we'd think about it. And if that was on a Zoom call, it'd be kind of this awkward silence. And what are you doing? I'm staring out the window just <laughs> thinking about it like, oh, that's a bit of an odd Zoom call. But when you're in person or you're just having a coffee together, you can do that. And I kind of feel we had so many good ideas that we went through and chatted about and just thought about deeply last week because we're in person. And I know a lot of businesses are opening up and I've kind of been slow to get back out and I'm very cautious about health and all of that. But it was so good catching up, Ian. And by the way, the burgers were great as well. Burger Patch in Chatswood. If you're ever over in Sydney in Chatswood, Burger Patch is the place to go. And listeners, uh, I'll put it out there. If you are in Sydney or you do come to Sydney, please message us on whatever platform you're on and let us know. We'd love to meet you, have a coffee or even have a burger. Yeah, by the way, if you get the show notes and you want to see a picture of the burgers, there they are in glorious high resolution. Great burgers. Anyway. All right. On to some quick shots of the week, Craig. And so some of these things are rolling up. Some of the things um, we have started using. So customer journey analytics is one of them. Again, you need to have marketing enterprise to enable this. Mm. And I think this is in beta at the minute, uh, public beta. You've got visibility of meeting scheduling pages. So this is really good because if you've got a team and you want to see all the meeting scheduling pages, now you can. You don't have to. So can I just check on that? That's previously if you were a super admin, you could see it. But if you were just a team member, you couldn't see other people's meetings. Is that correct? No, I don't think so. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you can now see that, which is great. The next thing is you can use HubSpot calling from your, from the app the mobile device and so that's really good and we test we've been testing it out i had a chat with craig uh this week over hubspot calling and you couldn't tell that i was calling you from the app could you craig i couldn't tell but so is this new is it yeah it is new so what's new about that i thought you could so previously craig what would happen is that when you called from the app it would actually start the call uh on your mobile device so like Mm -hmm. you were just making a normal mobile call Mm-hmm. What this is doing is utilizing going through the HubSpot calling service. So oh, I think what it essentially right. does, like previously, it if you're on your desktop, it would call you and then it would call the person and then we'd connect the two together. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So it, it's actually, so if you're using a sales professional, for example, you would have 3,000 minutes included. This is the 3,000 minutes that's included in there. You can record the call. And get it transcribed if you're obviously on uh, enterprise. You can leave notes while you're on there. You can leave the outcome and you can say how the call went. So there are a few things that I like about it that you can do and you can utilize those minutes. So can I just check with the call recording, if you'd been recording the call with me, would I have got a notification or some kind of message that I was being recorded? Actually, that's a good question. I didn't test that part. But I think the usual thing to, is you've sure. got to tell people yeah. that you want to record it. So it's not on by, def- on by default, but mm. you've got to tell them and click the button. before. Yeah. You by the way, them. there's our mobile numbers on the screen. <laughs> we were chatting earlier. People were saying, oh, should we, should we hide our numbers? No, I make it available on the website. Call me. I can hardly ever take calls. So leave me a <laughs> message because I'm always in meetings. So. But yeah. What else have we got? All right. Um, we've got... What one thing that they have rolled out is owners will now sync in data sync apps, which I thought was really interesting because that's often a sticky point when data sync is happening. So I need to see how far that's rolled out, but I think that's happening right now. And then finally, we've got some new task priority options on mobile. So again, a great way to work through your tasks in priority mode on a mobile device. So I think it's just getting better day by day, Craig. Yeah. One more quick shot, uh, and this isn't in one of our feature shots. It's just a quick shot because I was just playing with it today. This deal pipeline totals. Uh, this has been a very popular request. Uh, if you've got deals in different currencies and maybe you've got teams in different currencies, you've got the US team, the AU team, the UK team, 
they're working uh, in different currencies and then they want to look at the totals at the bottom of pipelines, stages in, in board view. And it would always be just in the default portal currency. So one currency in all the teams. But now you can switch it. Uh, I've got an example in the show notes. Uh, if it's switched there, you can see uh, here it is in US. Versus, and then if I still hover over it, I can see the AUD equivalent. That's all based on the currencies that you set up in settings. And you just go and uh, you can change that on the fly on the board from board actions top right on your board view pipelines. The, the only thing I'll say about this, I was, it's saved at the board uh, view. So it's not saved at the view level. I was kind of hoping it would save it in the views so I could have oh, USD view and AUD view and just switch. I'll just choose the views because that's my preferred ones. But no, it's actually a board action. So, But look, certainly a lot better, a big improvement. I know people have been asking for this for a while. All right, on to our marketing feature of the week and setting lifecycle stages on forms. And so this is something new that we're actually really liking and enjoying and you'll see this as an option to set the life cycle stage. And why would this be important, Craig? So let's say you've got forms for different stages of the funnel. You've got some top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. Previously, let's say you had a, a stronger intent form. Someone signed up for a demo, for example. Oh, that's more intent. That's more a middle of the funnel or bottom of the funnel kind of action. Okay, you'd have that form. Then you'd create a workflow. Look, it's not a lead. We're actually going to call that one sales qualified or whatever. No, now just set it on the form. So here it is in the form options. Very handy. And uh, I think that's, that's going to save workflows being created just for this. Uh, so really handy feature. And by the way, speaking of lifecycle stages, if we go into shot for our HubSpot sales feature of the week, uh, we did allude to this previously, but you can now set the default lifecycle stage when a deal is created. I think we might have mentioned this last episode or just touched on it, but this is so popular now. Because a lot of companies, they when they create a deal, they don't want them to be set as opportunity, which was previously was the default. Perhaps they're doing pre-qualification. They do want to create a deal. They actually just want it to be sales qualified. And then when it moves along a particular stage of the deal pipeline, then it becomes an opportunity. Well, you can set that now in the options lifecycle stages there. There's a whole lot more around lifecycle stages. You can create your custom lifecycle stages and things like that. I'm not going to talk about that in this episode but i think this particular one is going to be very popular i think a lot of people will set life cycle stage to sales qualified lead when a deal is created rather than opportunity i know what's your thoughts your mileage may vary i guess but what's your thoughts on this one ian yeah totally and i think it just depends on the business and how they run their sales process but i think this is a great start in understanding or just setting the life cycle stage. Now, listeners, please note, and it says this everywhere, once the life cycle stage goes forward, it doesn't go backwards. So just be aware of that. You can change it manually or you have to clear the property in a workflow before you set it if it does go backwards. All right, the service feature of the week, Craig, what is it? Ticket portal settings. Yeah, so we're talking about um, actually customer portal uh, for customers logging in to view their tickets. So you're using tickets in Service Hub. Uh, customers have a ticket. They want to log into the customer portal and see their tickets. And so then the question is, oh, can I see just my tickets or can I see everyone in my company's tickets? The answer is you can choose. So for example, and we've got a, a whole screenshot in the show notes, if you go to the custom portal uh, settings, you can actually set this. You can say, allow your customers to view only their tickets or any tickets from their company. And so you think, oh, great, I'll uh, choose one. Here's the problem. It's a global setting. So whilst this is good, I'd much prefer this to be at the pipeline, ticket pipeline stage because lots of our clients have internal and external ticket pipelines. So they might have an external uh, ticket customer support pipeline. Oh, yep, can uh, have tickets that they're working with. So there... For a company, yep, anyone from that company logs in, sees their tickets, they'll see anyone else's tickets from the company as well. That's handy. But what about internal ticket pipelines? And businesses are increasingly doing this. Oh, internal staff requests and things like that. Well, in that case, if you were to log in uh, to the portal, you only want to see your particular tickets. Keep in mind, for big enterprises, not everyone in the, in the company is in HubSpot. They're not all HubSpot users. But they might just be logging tickets, you know, set up an internal form on an intranet, log a ticket, goes in. 
still manage in HubSpot, but those particular staff members aren't in HubSpot. But they want to log in and see their tickets. So they're treated like a customer in a sense. In that case, you don't want them seeing all the other tickets from other staff members. So there's these two use cases that are pretty common. And so this option being global doesn't support that. I will go on a little bit of a rant now, Ian. By the way, I haven't put this in the show notes. Didn't want to put it in writing, but I will just say this on the show. And I'll get your thoughts on this, Ian, because I don't know if I'm understanding this correctly, but I kind of feel that with Service Hub, there's good and the bad. I think the ticket pipelines themselves, very strong enterprise class, as we talked about last episode, running business processes with ticket pipelines, I think that's an enterprise level piece you can very easily scale. But with their knowledge base and their customer portal, I'm just like, it seems like small business. It's like someone just didn't have the vision to see where this is going for enterprise. So when we're talking with enterprises, we're like, oh, should we use ticket pipelines? Yep, service up, great. Ticket pipelines, great. Should we use knowledge base and customer portal? We're kind of like, "Mm, probably not. It's pretty average. And I just don't get it, Ian. They just didn't have the vision. If you think about marketing uh, hub, they are gunning for Marketo. If you think about sales hub, they are gunning for Salesforce. That's, you know, that's their North Star. That's what they're looking for. Service hub, what are they aiming at? It's like they're not looking at Zendesk and saying, we want to be like Zendesk. They're saying, oh, we just want to be like some Mickey Mouse, small business service, just little ticket platform. I just don't get it. Where's the vision? I'd love to know the answer, but this is what uh, kind of concerns me because I don't know if it's the uh, product development team or whether they had limited budget or someone said, look, let's just get the basics, you know, let's just do minimum viable products, see how it goes, and then we'll expand on it if it gets traction. It's like, well, I can tell you that's going to be a self-defeating uh, approach because people aren't using it, enterprises aren't using it, they're getting frustrated with the ticket portal, they won't use it, won't get used, that'll come through on their uh, metrics and then they won't improve it. So I kind of, I'm, I'm concerned about this customer portal. I've got a client we're working with, customer portal after a couple of months of trying to make it work. We're just kind of like, I just don't think this is the product for you. Go to Zendesk. Talking with an uh, enterprise client. Oh, we want this uh, customer portal piece and doing some development. Should we use HubSpot for that? I'm like, no, you can't. Frankly, that's a Zendesk piece. Kind of frustrating. I'm really happy with where they're going, sales and marketing. I just don't know what they're doing on Service Hub. Am I being harsh here, Ian? Oh, by the way, one more thing. Um, you'd think things like business units or um, added domains would give you the ability to create more knowledge bases or have different customer portal. You, no, you'd, it, it's just like, well, what's going on? What have I missed, Ian? Am I, am I being harsh here? Or And by the way, it's not often I'm negative on this show, right? I'm a no. big fan. And frankly, I want to use this more and I really want to use it for our clients, but I'm just like, well, I've got to call it as I see it. Uh, am I seeing it correctly? Well, Craig, I, th- I would have to agree. I think those are two areas that are kind of lacking mm. and have a very, they're very tightly constrained, right? So when mm. we're talking to businesses as well, it says customer board and they go, yeah, let's use that. I want to put some documents in there for customers. I want to be able to do this. Oh no, it's really a ticket portal. And that's where it stops. So maybe there is vision with the name of where it's heading and we're not probably seeing what's heading into that. So that might be one thing to be aware of. I think Mm. knowledge base, like you've highlighted before, it's like we are able to scale everything else, but knowledge base seems to not be able to scale. So it feels Mm. like it's been stuck there for a while. So I think that's one thing that we're just hoping and praying that improves and I think we just want to see some incremental improvements coming through. Mm. So let's let's uh, let's just stay informed. I say. Fingers crossed. All right. What's the gotcha of the week, Craig? All right. It's going to sound and like the- I'm having a, a bit of a whinge about HubSpot this week, and not. I, I love the product, but I I think people trust us for our actual um, views on things like this. I want to talk to you about re-engagement campaigns because these are recommended, and you know HubSpot's got a whole good blog post on it. So we're like, yeah, great, great idea, re-engagement campaign. So what is it? You've got a bunch of contacts that you might not have uh, emailed for a little while, uh, perhaps a couple of months. And so you're kind of like, I wonder if they're still interested. I'll, I'll send them an email and ask them. So that's what we did. We've been doing this for a few clients. By the way, these are all legit contacts. So nothing imported, nothing purchased. Like they'd, they'd actually filled out forms. So they've been in there. Uh, they were less than a year old uh, and some of them were like three months, old, you know, so recent contacts, but we hadn't really followed up with them after an e-box. All right, 
Let's just go. So what we, what did we do? We sent them an email, very simple. Do you still want to hear from us? If not, here's a big fat unsubscribe link. Unsubscribe. We don't want to annoy you anymore. Okay, that's that's a re-engagement campaign, Ian. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's exactly it. What's the goal of it? Well, to get a whole bunch of people to unsubscribe uh, so that we're not annoying them and we can remove them out of the database, right? Clean up our database. This is data hygiene. So what did we do? We did this, started sending out. Guess what? The account got, got, sus- got suspended by HubSpot. Suspended. You know why? Oh, unsubscribe rate was too high. I'll just mention not a single spam complaint, by the way, just unsubscribes, doing exactly yeah. what we asked. Do you want to hear from us? And so I've actually got a screenshot of one of them. You can see there. By the way, we started batching these into small lists yeah, so of you just could... 100. We thought we'll be cautious because we were mostly concerned about spam reports. Not concerned about unsubscribe, that's the whole goal, but spam reports. Not a single spam report. We got, um, <laughs> got suspended, got to do all these things. Now, will HubSpot unsuspend us? Probably. We'll follow the process and I think they'll see it and go, yeah, okay. But, uh, but, but my point is here, well, first of all, I don't think HubSpot's got a very good process for this. They just, or I don't know, do you have to mark an email as this is a re-engagement email or something like that? It's kind of weird. But what's the takeaway? It's like, well, we've got to think very carefully about whether we're going to do re-engagement campaigns. And you know what? I was thinking we should have just blasted them with an email, not shown the unsubscribe link, and most people just ignore it and won't unsubscribe anyway. It's like the whole goal of keeping your data clean backfired on us. So we've got, we've got a couple of clients that are, currently suspended and it makes us look bad. And they're like, what have you done? <laughs> I'm just like, anyway, what's your experience, Ian? Have you had, have you had success with re-engagement campaigns? Or? I haven't had anything like this, but I have done a very similar process and had a high number of hard bounces because uh, we forgot to clean the list. But I find this really odd in your instance is that we're trying to do the right thing and the right thing has backfired on us. So mm. I really would love to know what they intend on doing or what is what should be the right way we should be doing this. Like we, uh, you intentionally did something mm. and I think you did the right thing. The question is why are we being penalized for it? So I'd really like to understand. I think listeners, if you are – Like I think data hygiene, like we talk about, is really important, especially today when there's so much noise and, you know, people sign up for all sorts of things. They might sign up for a special offer and then they never open your email. So understanding all of those things actually matters. And I know that certain customers of ours send things to certain government departments. And I know that there are people that never get, get those emails because like we have a look at the stats and we see domains that are never people never ever open emails on. So that's the next thing that we're trying to get get through with all of this stuff. So I think, you know what, Craig, I'd love to hear what the what the response is and what the way forward is because we can't be the only people doing this. All right. Well, I'll update this next week if we get a response back from HubSpot about what we should be doing. You know, it sounds like I've been grumpy this episode. <laughs> so let's change that. What's the inside of the week, Craig? Well, this is a reminder and around gratitude and yes i'm preaching to myself here i think the thing that i'm learning or being reminded of is that people have it tough we all have it tough we've had people lose uh, you know family members die in the last couple of weeks and there's floods fires wars of course there's market meltdowns interest rates all this kind of thing it can seem like there's doom and gloom and i don't want to downplay that there are people with in very difficult circumstances But here's the thing, can I do anything about that? Can I control that? What can I control? Well, all I can control is the way I respond to it, really. That's where I have control. And so I was reminding myself, you and I were chatting about this, to be grateful for the things that are going well for us or that we've got through. And so maybe, listeners, this is a good reminder for you as well. I don't know where you're at at this point in time. Maybe you're going through hardship. Maybe you've escaped it. Maybe you've got survivor guilt. Sometimes when people around you are having hard times and you're not, you kind of feel, oh, that's unfair. Maybe I should manufacture some hardship for myself, you know, these crazy things. No, just be grateful. Uh, have a, a moment to, to turn off the news headlines, sit back and focus on being thankful. And you've actually re- made a note here about writing it down. I know you do this, Ian. You actually write down in, in a journal. Yeah, yeah and I've even started, I've got a little... Um 
a sticky note uh, board in my room and I in my bedroom actually, and I write stuff on there as well. So it's it's really good because everybody sees it in the house, and sometimes the boys go and put their own little comments on it. So oh, nice. <laughs> Fascinating what it does when you give space for things like that. All right, we've got a list of question of the week, Craig. All right, it's, I'll just explain the setup for this uh, in a client call. And they've said, oh, how can I stop my personal emails getting logged into HubSpot or some of my staff member ones? So in their particular company, they'd sent an email to another person in the company and then it had got logged into HubSpot. And they were like, how did this happen? They had the in they're using outlook and they've got the hubspot plugin that has the option to log and it's automatically ticked on and you can t- untick in that they'd forgot to but it had logged something quite personal that they were talking another team member straight into hubspot and they're like oh my goodness what's happened and so is there any way i can stop that yet yeah, the answer is yes it's hubspot's never log settings these can be set in two places uh first up you can set it personally and this is in your personal preferences uh and we've got uh, screenshots in the show notes about that. Uh, for example, my wife, I've put her in the never log, so there's no chance I'll accidentally send something to my wife and it gets logged into HubSpot. Um, we've also got uh, some suppliers we work with or um, project management systems uh, and also family and friends, also finances, anything that I send to my accountant, I make sure that doesn't accidentally get logged into HubSpot. But then in the global settings, yeah, you can actually turn it off for other team uh, for your company domain so that nothing that you send internally ever gets logged uh accidentally against hubspot so yeah it's there make use of it never log settings by the way in our quick checks and health checks that we do with clients this is kind of one of the first things we look at and we highlight it and that'll save you a lot of pain i know on this particular call we're having with a client some of them were breaking out in cold sweats one worrying about oh hang on what have I logged? And so they're rushing into HubSpot to check. And so in that case, we actually said delete out any contacts that are actually company or staff members, just delete them out and get rid of that. But yeah, this is a bit of a lifesaver, the never log email settings. So what's interesting, Craig, is that I'm wondering why never log doesn't have a default for the company domain that should be on unless you turn it off as opposed to you have to put it in I guess that's maybe coming down the line. Yeah, maybe. I I can see both sides. But certainly if you're setting up a new portal, I mean, it's one of the first things we do. We're like, oh, shall we automatically block any of your own internal emails from turning up in HubSpot? Yep. Uh, now, for some cli- companies, they might not. They might want to log it for some reason, have contacts, internal contacts, maybe. Can't think of a p- compelling case for that, but it's possible. But yeah, by default, I would I would block it. Okay. What's our thought of the week, Craig? The joy of unread books. And this started with a conversation we were having as we were reflecting on the books we were reading and going back to and even listening to. And you might think that buying a book and not reading is a waste of time. And I think, you know what? I grew up with that all through school. I was thinking, and it used to actually frighten me when I saw a really large book. I'm like, I can't read all of that straight away. And so, you know, what if we have a library full of books that we have wasted and never did anything? And I think what happened was as I um, went on this journey of business and I learned from different people, it's like, hey, if I buy that book and I read the one thing that I need help with and I can take action on that, that book has been valuable to me. And I, when I changed it to that, I was like, oh, Okay. Well, I did, I, that fear, fear left me and I was like, okay, well, I need to learn more about this. Let me go and find out so I can make that better. And you've got some thoughts here, Craig. I'll, I'll just quickly say, because I, I think listeners know that I like reading books uh, and I've got my, I'm standing in front of my bookshelves here at the office, I like reading books. By the way, do you know a, a, a customer said to me one time, oh, all your books, you're just showing off. I'm like, Apparently, having reading books is showing off now. I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> have we got to the point where people don't read anything that... Anyway, I, I like reading books. I don't think that's a brag or anything. It's just something I like doing. But here's the thing. If it makes people feel better, they think I'm showing off. A lot of the books behind me I haven't read. I've started. I've read a little bit and I've said, no, it's not for me or I'll come back to that. And I think that's fine. And so lots of books and at home, we've got lots of books. And it's like a lot of them are unread. 
And that's a good thing because it's a reminder that we know so little. If you haven't even read all the books on your bookshelf, then that's only a micro <laughs> micro subset of the billions of books out there. Actual knowledge and what you know is so minor. So actually having a lot of books behind me reminds me how little I know and to be constantly learning. The other thing though is that there's a time for books. I've found this, I've started a book and now nah, it's not for me. And I've come back years later, I've read it, I'm going, this is the time for this book. And I've, I've read it now. And that's happened over the years. And that's, that's one of the wonderful things about having a library of unread books. Here's the knowledge you have the potential to consume. I love that. And so it's not a waste. By the way, you know what is a waste? You buy a book and then you force yourself to read it because you think you're obligated to. What a waste of time that is. If it's not providing any impact, no effect in right. your life, you've actually wasted time. So it's fine. In my in my book, it's fine <laughs> not to read books. I think uh, another thing that I've learned from hanging out with you, Craig, is that not be afraid to mark the book, share snippets of it. I often love when you share snippets of messages with me and you mark stuff out. I think that's really good. And I grew up keeping everything pristine. And so just to mark a book or to highlight something was a big step for me. But now I'm quite happy to do that because I go, okay, well, you know, I'm learning. And then sometimes when I go back, I'm like, oh, that was really good. I need to be reminded of that. And just like I said with that earlier book that we're talking about, predictable sales or what is it? Predictable revenue. Predictable revenue. Same thing. Slightly different uh, take, but really good reminder of the things that we need to be focusing on Mm. and doing. So I think like I was rightly saying to you, I think the whole idea is I want, a, it's, like, it's like food, right? I have a craving for this thing at a particular time and that's what I'm searching for to fill that hunger. And a book, I guess, essentially is like that. So encourage people, if you haven't gone and read a book or you, you sh- you're thinking about something, go and read it or even borrow it off somebody. Lots of people have books. I often borrow Craig, Craig's books. Yeah. So it's a great and, way to and also, share. Also format, I like reading books in physical format. I know a lot of people don't. They just have the Kindle. So they've probably got massive libraries on books. You'd never know because it's all digital. I happen to have mine physically. I like it. I like highlighting it. Uh, that just works for me. Probably I'm old school. Your kids probably don't read physical books, do they, Ian? They're probably all they digital. They do, Craig. We oh, actually do? have lots of physical books oh, that they read. Fantastic. Yeah. That's good. All right. On to our quote of the week. And this is from Keanu Reeves. Money doesn't mean anything to me. I made lo- a lot of money, but I want to enjoy life and not stress about building my bank account. I give lots of it, lots away and live simply, mostly out of a suitcase in hotels. We all know that good health is much more important. And you know what? I could not agree more. <laughs> we're, we're both, well, uh, you're younger than me, but we've, we've got to that age where health is a focus for us and as listeners know from some of the health things with my wife and that over the last couple of months it's it's our top focus health totally agree thanks Keanu all right Craig talk about HubSpot quick check yeah reminder about our quick check we also have advisory sessions we'll chat about that maybe next uh, episode this is really just a, a quick way if he, here's the key use case you've inherited HubSpot Someone else set it up in your company before. You've inherited it and you're like, mm, has this been set up well? What's going on? I don't understand it. We're using it to its fullest. Uh, is it worth the money? Book in for a quick check. It's 90 minutes. We'll go through with you. We'll analyze all parts of your HubSpot portal at a high level. And at the end, we give you three to five recommendations. Use this, fix this, change this, and this will imp- increase the effectiveness of HubSpot for your business. More details on the HubShot site and you can book in for a session there. Or simply search HubSpot Quick Check in Google and you will find it under all the paid ads. All right. Well, listeners, again, make sure you sign up for the show notes and you can do that at hubshots.com. And also, we also have been working on our YouTube channel. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe and turn on the notifications as we are rolling more things into there. 
We've got little short, quick episodes. We've got shorts and we're just mixing it up a bit. So if you're listening to that podcast, go check out it on YouTube. Well, Craig, until next week. Catch you later, Ian. Thank you.